Surah Al-Taghabun, as you're familiar, is a Makki surah or a Madani surah? Exactly. Madani, but some have said that some of the verses in the surah are Makki. As we can see at the beginning of the surah, there are many things mentioned such as the fact that the Day of Judgment is Yawmul Jam or Yawmul Taghabun. And remember that it is a characteristic of the Makki surahs to have the concepts of Tawheed, Imaniyat, Akhirah in them. So generally verses that talk about the hereafter or matters related to belief, then remember that those verses are found in which surahs? Makki surahs. But here we have a Madani surah talking about matters of the Day of Judgment. And this is why some scholars have said that part of the surah may be Makki. So ayah number 14, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuha alladhina amanu, O you people who have believed, O people of iman, inna min azwajikum, indeed some of azwajikum, your azwaj, your spouses, wa awladikum, and also your children, meaning some of your spouses, some of your children, among them, there are those who are aduwallakum, an enemy to you. Among your spouses and your children, there could be those who are in reality your enemy. Fahdaruhum. So what do you have to do? You have to be cautious of them. You have to be careful. You have to be on guard. Wa in tarfu, and if you pardon, if you show pardon, wa tasfahu, and you overlook, wa tafiru, and you forgive. Pardon, overlook the faults of, and forgive who? Your spouses and your children. If you deal with them in this manner, which manner? Forgiveness and tolerance. Then what will happen? Fa inna Allah ghafurur rahim. Then indeed Allah. He is definitely forgiving and merciful. Meaning if you show forgiveness and mercy to others, then Allah will show forgiveness and mercy to you. Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, he was asked about this ayah, that what does this ayah mean? I mean, when it comes to spouses and children, we see that this is a very beautiful relationship, right? Marriage is a blessing. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself says in the Qur'an that وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ It is from amongst his signs in Surah Al-Rum that it is from amongst his signs that he has made for you your spouses. وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةً وَرَحْمَةً And he has put between you love and mercy. Isn't it? So the relationship between husband and wife, between parents and children, is understood to be a relationship of love, of friendship, of support, of mercy, of affection. Right? In the Quran we learn Surah Al-Baqarah that you are clothing for them and they are clothing for you. Meaning this is the relationship between husband and wife. Over and over again we are taught to deal with the spouse in which manner? In the manner of ma'roof. Correct? When it comes to children also, the relationship between parents and children, we see that children are repeatedly advised in the Quran to deal with their parents in which manner? In the manner of ihsan. Wabil walidaini. Ihsana. Correct? So we see that generally in the Quran, what we understand with regards to the relationship of a husband and wife, with regards to the relationship of parent and child, is that this is a relationship of love, respect, affection, mercy. Correct? But here we see something very different being mentioned. And what is this? That your spouse and your child could be your enemy. So be careful. Now, first thing, remember, this is not a general statement. This verse is not saying that a person's spouse is definitely going to be their enemy or that their children are definitely going to be their enemy. This is not a general statement. It's a very specific statement. It is said, inna min azwajikum. Meaning, it could be that a person's spouse is their enemy. It could be that their child becomes their enemy. So Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu was asked about this ayah, that what is the meaning of this ayah? So he said that this verse was revealed concerning people who embraced Islam in Mecca. They became Muslim in Mecca and they wanted to do hijrah to Medina. 
That was their intention. They wanted to migrate to Medina. And what was the reason? To be closer to the Prophet wasallam, to have more freedom and ease in practicing Islam, right? In order to continue learning from the Prophet wasallam. You see, at that time, you know how people learned the Qur'an? How? Was it that every time the Prophet ﷺ received revelation, okay, send a message? Yeah, forward that to a group and then that's it, done? News will spread like a wildfire? No, it didn't happen like that. People would learn Qur'an, how? Either by traveling to places where they were Muslim, or when Muslims were traveling, they would meet them. In Bukhari, we learn of a hadith of a young companion, a little boy he was at that time, who had learned Qur'an, they lived far from Medina, and he had learned Qur'an from who? From people who would be traveling. So every time there were travelers passing by, he would ask them. So any more surahs? Any more Qur'an? And so he memorized a lot of the Qur'an. So much so that he was the one who had memorized most Qur'an from amongst his people. And so he was appointed as their imam. He would lead them in prayer. And he was so little... So young, and you know, his family didn't really care much about his clothing because he was a little kid, right? So much so that when he would go into sujood, his private part would show from the back. His clothing was so short. So one day a lady got really upset. She said, cover your imam. So everybody got together. They pitched in money. They put together something for him, a dress for him. And they gave him that that dress to wear. And he said that he was so proud of that dress that he got because he would wear it for imama in order to lead people in prayer. So the reason why I'm mentioning this to you is because people would want to be in Medina or closer to Medina. Why? So that they would be able to learn the Qur'an. They would be able to learn Islam. Remember that Qur'an was not revealed in one day. Right? So people living at the time of the Prophet wasallam, if they really wanted to increase in their knowledge, they had to be closer to Rasulullah wasallam In space also. So what happened? These people, they wanted to migrate to Medina. Whenever they made the intention to do hijrah, their wives and their children, they would start crying. And they would refuse to allow them to go to Medina. So basically the children said that, no, we're fine here. The wives said, no, we're fine here. It's okay. We don't want to go. We'll survive here. We don't want to leave Mecca. We have our home. Our life is set. Things are established. Why should we relocate? They didn't want to. So what happened eventually, after a long time, when they did go to the Prophet ﷺ, they saw that people had gained so much knowledge in the deen, and they had done so much for the deen, that these people who didn't do hijrah, they felt, how? How do you think? They felt way behind. They didn't know much Qur'an. They didn't know much about the rulings of the deen. They had missed out on so much learning. They had missed out on so much opportunity. Why? Because they had intended to go, but who prevented them? It was their families. Right? It was their families that prevented them from going. So these people, they got so upset with their families that they intended to punish them. It's like when you get upset that I missed out on this opportunity because of you. You know what? I'm going to show it to you. I'm going to punish you. I'm going to take some kind of revenge. So they wanted to take revenge from their families. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this ayah. وَإِن تَعْفُوا وَتَصْفَحُوا وَتَغْفِرُوا فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ غَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ Whatever has happened, has happened. Now be careful in the future. And for now, how should you deal with your families? You should pardon them, overlook their mistakes, and forgive them. And when you will deal with them in this manner, then Allah will also show mercy and forgiveness to you. In Surah An-Nur, Ayah 22, Allah says, أَلَا تُحِبُّونَ أَنْ يَغْفِرَ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ Will you not like that Allah should forgive you? Now if you think about it, this is something very true. Why is it that so many times we get left behind or we miss out on great opportunities? What is the reason? What is the reason? Many times it is our families. Isn't it? It's our loved ones. That we want to be with them. We want to spend time with them. We want to take care of them. So as a result of that, who do we neglect? Who? Ourselves. 
Right? And I think as women, we can understand this very well. What happens to a woman when she gets married? She will even stop her education. She will take a year off from school. And then what happens? A baby comes in. And then she never really goes back to school. Or she takes a long time. And then finally she goes back to school. Isn't it? So, many times a person wants to go for Umrah or for Hajj. But that costs money. And where is their money going? On their family. Right? Not that it's wrong to spend on the family. This is something that Allah has legislated. Not that it is wrong to look after your family. This is something that Allah has legislated. And Allah will question us about it. Right? However, what is meant here is that فَحْذَرُوهُمْ Be careful. Don't lose yourself in taking care of your families. Don't forget yourself in showing love to your families, in pleasing them. They have a right and you have a right. While you're concerned about teaching and educating your children, you should be concerned about teaching and educating yourself also. I mean, as women or as parents, how concerned we become about teaching our children. My child is two and a half years old. He better learn how to read already. Right? We're so concerned. But what about us? So often it is that parents are concerned about their children learning the Qur'an or memorizing the Qur'an. What about me? What about us? So, إِنَّ مِنْ أَزْوَاجِكُمْ وَأَوْلَادِكُمْ عَدُوًّا لَكُمْ It is quite possible that they can be an enemy to you. Now remember that adawa, enmity, this is the first level of enmity. This is basically to not be in aid of someone. Do not be in aid of someone. And instead, whatever they're trying to do, prevent them from accomplishing their goal. So many times, it is our closest ones that hinder us from pursuing our goals, that prevent us from going further. Yes. He once told us in class that you have to spend some time away from your family so that you can spend time with them forever, as in, in Jannah. So right now, the time that you sacrifice being away from your family, it's not necessarily a sacrifice because, inshallah, you're working towards a greater goal. Yes, inshallah. Now, we see that the people that a person lives with, the people that a person is closest to in terms of relationship, they can become his greatest test. They can become our greatest test. In fact, if you think about it, people that we live with, they are a daily test. Aren't they? I mean, if there is a person who didn't allow you to pray, right? You go to some office and you say, it's time, you know, for me to pray. May I please pray here? They say, no. They don't allow you to pray. So you decide, I'm never going back there again. Khalas. I'm done. I don't like those people. I don't like that building. I don't like that office. Okay. But if it's your own family, it's Maghrib time. And one person says, I want dinner. And another person says, can you pass this for me? And another person wants something else. And another person wants something else. And if you keep going after them one after the other, you're going to delay your prayer. Isn't it? And what happens in these times is that we lose our patience. We show anger. We become upset. We yell at them. Or sometimes we don't behave with them the way we should. So, what does Allah say? In ta'fu wa tasfahu. What is ta'fu? Afu. Afu is to, is tarkul uquba. It is to not punish. And tasfahu, safh. What is safh? Tarkul mulama. To not even let the other person feel bad. You know, sometimes we will put the food and we'll say, you know, I, I, it's time for prayer. I have my class. I have a test. I have an assignment. You know, through our manner, we let the other person know that we're doing them a favor and that they're preventing us from doing something good. Saf is tarkul mulama. Do not even let the other person feel bad. Taghfiru, maghfira. What is maghfira? Satru dham wa tajawuz anhu. Just forget about it. Forget about what they did and not remember it tomorrow or the day after or next week. And this is what you have to do all day long when you're dealing with your families. You see, sometimes it is 
the spouse or it is the children or it could be the parents, it could be the siblings, it could be the closest family members that prevent a person from obeying Allah. Like for example, a woman wants to wear the hijab and she doesn't get that cooperation and support from the family. Right? She wants to learn the Qur'an and she doesn't get that support from the family. He wants to study and he doesn't get that support from the family. It happens. So, you know, when you're living with the people who are not supporting you, or who are indirectly hindering you, then what do you do? What do you have to do? In the morning, da'fu. In the afternoon, tasfahu. And in the evening, taghfiru. That's what you have to do all day long. Show pardon and forgiveness. Because if you don't, you're going to be living with a heavy heart. You're going to be living with a lot of guilt. Ta'fu wa tasfahu wa taghfiru. Now, do you notice over here in this ayah, Allah does not say that your parents could be your enemies. Yeah? Why do you think so? Why spouse? Because at this stage of life, when a person has their spouse and their children, then they're somewhat independent. They make their own decisions. Their parents say, you're free. Or they're living on their own. Right? The girl is married off, she's living with her family. Parents are where? In a different country. Yeah, she talks to them, but they don't dictate what she does. They don't dictate what she wears. They don't dictate where she goes. She's independent. She's free. You understand? So then who is the challenge? It's the spouse and it's the children. And when it comes to parents, generally, what do the parents say? Do whatever you want. I don't want anything from you. And this is one of the greatest things about parents, that what they want for their children Many times, I'm not talking about all parents, but many times this is the case with parents, that they want their children to be happy. Which is why you will find even an old woman willing to prepare food for her son who is more than capable of going and buying food for himself. Why will she stand up and make food for her son? Because she wants good for him. Parents constantly give to their children. Isn't it? And spouse and children, what do they do? They constantly take. Right? So parents are not mentioned over here. And if parents do prevent a person from khair, then in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned that. In Surah Al-Ankabut, in Surah Luqman, Surah Al-Ankabut, Ayah 8, Allah says, وَوَصَّيْنَ الْإِنسَانَ بِوَالِدَيْهِ husna." We have enjoined upon man to be good towards his parents. وَإِنْ جَاهَدَاكَ لِتُشْرِكَ بِمَا لَيْسَ لَكَ بِهِ عِلْمٍ فَلَا تُطِعْهُمَا But if they force you and they strive against you to associate partners with Allah, to commit shirk, then what do you do? You don't obey them. However, وَصَاحِبْهُمَا فِي الدُّنْيَا مَعْرُوفًا Live with them in this world in a good manner. But when it comes to spouse and children, then a person has a sense of authority and control over them. Right? My children, I'm the parent. Right? My spouse. Even as a wife, there is a certain level of control, or not necessarily control, but it's a different relationship. Parents, you can't leave. But a spouse, you know that you can leave. You understand my point? When it comes to parents, can you ever say, that's it, I don't know you anymore. Khalas. We're ending our relationship. You don't do that. But with a spouse, you can always end the relationship. You understand? So you have some level of control over this relationship. And in Surah Furqan, Allah says, وَجَعَلْنَا بَعْضَكُمْ لِبَعْضٍ فِتْنَةً أَتَصْبِرُونَ We have made some of you a test and trial for others. So are you going to be patient? Are you going to show patience or not? So here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is warning us very clearly that be careful. إِنَّ مِنْ أَزْوَاجِكُمْ وَأَوْلَادِكُمْ عَدُوًّا لَكُمْ You have to be careful. فَحْذَرُوهُمْ فَحْذَرُوهُمْ حِذْرٌ What is hidr? That you be careful. You are alert. Because what your spouse says can impact you. What your children say can hurt you. And as a result, you get angry. You know, with your parents, you control your tongue. But with your spouse and with your children, you let it loose. With your parents, there is a certain level of respect. So even when you disagree with them, you'll say, GG, you know, yeah, okay, sure. But when it comes to the spouse and children... You can lash out. You can say what you want. So, فَحْذَرُوهُمْ 
Because it's very easy to destroy our deeds. You know, on the one hand, a person is working so hard, striving so hard. I want to memorize the Qur'an. I'm going for my Qur'an class. And then you come home and your child, your son or your spouse says something mean to you and then you give it to them. And what you said or how you dealt with them washed away whatever good you had accumulated. So فَحْذَرُوهُمْ Be careful. Be on guard. There's a beautiful dua that we learn. And this dua is reported in As-Siltatu Sahiha that Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min jari su. O Allah, I seek your protection from an evil neighbor. Wa min zawjin tushayyibuni qabl al-mashib. And I also seek your protection from a spouse that will make me grow old before old age. You understand the meaning? A spouse that will make me grow old before old age. A source of constant worry and distress and anxiety. That a person doesn't feel relaxed at home. You know, marriage is supposed to bring sukoon. Right? But sometimes marriage can be a source of a lot of pain for a person. That they're constantly worried. Here's an argument. Or he's going to be upset with something. Or she's going to be unhappy about this. And what's happening? It's like you're living with an enemy. Instead of a companion with whom you're supposed to enjoy an intimate, loving relationship, you're living with an enemy. وَمِن زَوْجٍ تُشَيِّبُنِي قَبْلَ الْمَشِيبِ وَمِن وَلَدٍ يَكُونُ عَلَيَّ رَبًّا And oh Allah, I seek your protection against a child that becomes a master over me. Bosses me around, dictates what I do. As if I have no freedom, I feel shackled before my children. They have overpowered me, overwhelmed me. So I cannot find time to even remember you. I cannot find time to even pray with khushur. I cannot find time to recite the Qur'an. يَكُونُ عَلَيَّ رَبًّا وَمِن مَالٍ يَكُونُ عَلَيَّ عَذَابًا And I also seek your protection from wealth that will become a punishment for me. A source of constant pain and anguish for me. وَمِن خَلِيلٍ مَاكِرٍ And also from a treacherous friend. عَيْنُهُ تَرَانِي وَقَلْبُهُ يَرْعَانِي Whose eye looks at me but his heart watches me. Meaning, from on the surface he appears to be very sincere, but in his heart he's got other agendas. What's the agenda? That in ra'a hasanatan dafanaha, that if he sees something good in me, he hides it. Wa in ra'a sayyatan adha'aha, and if he sees something evil in me, he spreads it. So he's basically just befriending me to get to find my faults and to spread them. So, The first part of this dua, that I seek your protection against a spouse that will cause me to age before old age. Now, you see this enmity with spouse and children, it's very different. Very different. It's not like enmity to somebody from school or enmity to somebody from work. It's not like that. This is very different. Because a typical enemy, you can avoid them. Isn't it? You don't get along with your boss at work? Go say it to them one day, I quit. Right? And just, you know, just feel that relief. I quit and walk out the door. What a relief. But can you say that to your children? Can you? I quit as a mom. Bye. Can you do that? No. You have to deal with them every day. At breakfast they annoyed you? Well, wait till lunch. Right? And they're bothering you when they're three and four? Wait, wait till they hit teenage years. Right? And wait till they get married and they become their marriage problems to you then. Somebody once said to me, little kids, little problems. Bigger kids, bigger problems. And it's so true. So you can't quit. You can't just walk out. Right? A typical enemy, you can confront them. But your spouse, your children, can you confront them? You can't do that. A typical enemy, they do what they do to you out of hate and dislike. But your spouse and children, many times they will prevent you from deen or from doing khair. Why? Out of love. They want to be with you. 
They want you. They want to enjoy with you. They want to have a good time with you. And this is why they're unhappy that every week and morning you're gone. You understand? They're doing it out of love, not out of dislike. There could be somebody out there who doesn't like you and doesn't want you to learn. Doesn't want you to grow in your knowledge. Right? They want bad for you. But if your spouse is preventing you from learning, that's not because your spouse wants you to stay ignorant. Yeah, I want an ignorant wife. No. That's not the reason. The reason is, he wants you. They want companionship. They want time together. They're doing it out of love. And you see, many times these issues, they come up. Why? We have to dig deep, right? We have to go to the root. We get upset. Well, my husband is not supportive. My children are not supportive. Well, it's not because they hate you. It's out of love. So you have to be very patient. وَإِن تَعْفُوا وَتَصْفَحُوا وَتَغْفِرُوا You see, three words are mentioned over here for forgiveness. What does that mean? You have to show forgiveness all the time. Because if you keep grudges in heart, and if you start getting upset over little things, you're not going to get anywhere. So if you want to be at peace, and if you want to keep peace at home, then what do you have to do? تَعْفُوا وَتَصْفَحُوا وَتَغْفِرُوا You just have to ignore certain things. You have to pretend as if they didn't say anything to you. You just have to be happy, happy. You have to do that. Honestly. Recently I met a sister. I don't know how she lives, mashallah. But amazing. Her husband doesn't really talk much. Right? And he doesn't. I mean, you know some people, they talk a lot. But if he's a little upset, he'll just be quiet like the whole day. He's not that involved in the Muslim community. He's got his lifestyle fixed. He's he's set. And she's a very active member in her community. She's always volunteering, going out, helping out. And he's he wants to sit at home, watch a movie. He wants to go to a restaurant, eat dinner. He wants to go to his friend's house, enjoy over there. And, you know, she wears hijab. He didn't want her to wear hijab. They live in the States. And they live in a place where there aren't many Muslims. He didn't want her to do that. You can imagine if you're living like this, anything could cause an argument. Isn't it? Anything could cause an argument. And this is something that happens. But I was amazed at her akhlaq. She comes home, happy, happy. You know, as if nothing's wrong. And when she's so perky and smiling and happy, then what will happen to the other person? What will they do? What do you think? They will also reciprocate, right? Isn't it said that it's the mother who sets the mood of the house or the woman who sets the mood of the house? This is so true. Now, this doesn't mean that, you know, you just don't care about your spouse and you don't care about your children. No, it means... You give them their rights, but you also give yourself your rights. There is a time for your spouse. There is a time for your children. And that is something that you should not compromise on. Their rights, you cannot compromise on them. What they want from you, what they need from you, you cannot compromise on that. It is not right that just because you have a class or just because you have a test, you don't give them food and you don't prepare the food and what not. No, you have to do your part. But that should not be what your life is all about. There is a time for your family, a time for yourself. You give them their haq and you must give yourself your haq also. Innama amwalukum indeed your wealth. Wa awladukum and your children. Allah says they are only fitna. They are only a test. You see innama, what does it mean? Indeed only. Meaning this is the reality of your wealth and children. They are a test, a trial. And generally, what do we think of wealth and children? Blessing. They are indeed a blessing. But they're a blessing and a test. You know like a coin has two sides? So this is the same thing. One side, test. One side, blessing. They're blessing and test at the same time. Wallahu indahu. And Allah, He has ajrun alim, a great reward. How are wealth and children a test, a trial, a fitna? They're a test in the sense that they bring with them, you know, pain and hardship. Correct? 
you buy a car and then there is a hardship associated with it, you have to look after it, right? You live in a house and there is a hardship associated with that, you have to clean it, right? When it comes to children, there is hardship associated with children, right? So they bring with them hardship. But not just that, they are a fitna in the sense that they distract you from what? From akhirah. They distract you from fulfilling the purpose of your existence. They make you forget yourself. They do. لا تلهكم أموالكم ولا أولادكم عن ذكر الله. This is the fitna. They distract you from the dhikr of Allah. And so often, it's the temptation of wealth that leads a person towards haram. Isn't it? Towards unlawful. Because it's just so tempting. It's just so beautiful. It's just, everybody has it. I want it too. And in order to acquire that money, or in order to acquire that property, a person will compromise on their deen. It's a fitna. That money is a fitna. That house is a fitna. And in order to please children, in order to make them happy, again, a person will do things which are inappropriate, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not like. Israf, extravagance, showing off, compromising in our deen. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, إِنَّ لِكُلِّ أُمَّةٍ فِتْنَةٍ For every nation is a trial. And the fitna of the nation of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what is that fitna? It is mal, it is wealth. So, when it comes to Muslims, when it comes to us, our, one of the biggest trials in our lives is going to be what? Money. And this is so true. How much people will compromise on just to get more money? Just to get more property? In Surah Al-Kahf, Ayah 46, Allah says, Al-Malu wal-Banuna zinatul hayatid dunya. Wealth and children are just an adornment, a decoration for this life. And you see decoration, it's meant to be temporary. Right? We see every winter, Christmas lights, Christmas decorations, right? We see them. Now it's not just limited to the holiday season, it's throughout the year. If it's not one thing, it's something else going on. But those decorations, they come up and then where do they go? Garbage. Temporary. Wealth and children, they are also temporary blessings. وَالْبَاقِيَاتُ الصَّالِحَاتِ and what is going to remain is good deeds. They are خَيْرٌ عِنْدَ رَبِّكَ ثَوَابًا وَخَيْرٌ أَمَلًا So then what is the test? That who will you choose? Will you choose Allah or your money? Who will you give preference to? Allah or your children? Ibrahim alayhi salam, was he tested with respect to his children? Yes. He was told to slaughter Ismail. In Surah Al-Safat this is mentioned. So what did he do over there? Did he give preference to Allah or to his awlad, his walad? To Allah. فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ So fear Allah. مَسْتَطَعْتُمْ As much as you are able. Istita'a is one's capacity. Whatever is within one's capacity. So fear Allah as much as you can. What does this mean? Do the best that you can. Because many times, due to our wealth or due to our spouses or children, we are put in a position where we have to let go of something. Right? Like for example, spouse is not supportive of deen. Hmm? For instance, if there is a woman and her husband says, don't wear this hijab. And I remember a sister once came to me and she said, that when she started wearing the hijab, her husband would just sit at just by the door. And he says, as soon as you take it off, we'll leave. When you take that off, we will leave. I'm waiting here. You understand? Now what do you do? On the one hand is Allah's command. And on the other hand is your spouse telling you, we're not walking out of the door until and unless you take that off. What do you do there? You understand? And and she wanted to keep her hijab on. And her husband wouldn't support at all. Not at all. So initially she said, I would take it off because there was you know no way that I could go 
with that on. He wouldn't allow at all. And then she said, then one day I thought, that's it. I'm going to put my foot down. If he can be stubborn, I can be stubborn also. And she said, I didn't remove it. He didn't want her to wear long abaya. So she said, okay, fine. But this is not coming off. The hijab is not coming off. So, فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ مَا اسْتَطَعْتُمْ She did her best. She did at least the bare minimum. You understand? She did at least the bare minimum. She kept this on, the hijab on. But when it came to her abaya, there was no discussion over there. I mean, he wouldn't even allow her to put this on. How do you think he would allow her to put an abaya on? So this is فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ مَا اسْتَطَعْتُمْ We think فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ مَا اسْتَطَعْتُمْ is somebody is giving me a dirty look. Oh, I'll take it off. Right? Somebody is not saying, wow, that looks really good. I'm so proud of you. They don't show outright support. We'll say, I won't even pray. This is not فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ مَا اسْتَطَعْتُمْ فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ مَا اسْتَطَعْتُمْ is that you do your best and you do the maximum that you can do with the intention of going further. With the intention of going further. So this particular sister, she said that for a long time, she would just remove her hijab when she would be with her husband. But otherwise, when she's on her own, when she's going to the store, when he's not there in the car, when he's not with her, she would keep it on. You understand? For a couple of months this happened. And then eventually she put her foot down, she put the hijab on also, and now mashallah things are good. Yes. I know one of the couple, the girl was from Aluda, she did the course, she's totally changed. Husband was totally westernized, and he used to stay in late nights. So in the beginning there was a lot of fights, a lot of problems. And after four or five years, she said, what I am doing, what I am earning, I'm learning Islam and I'm making my husband happy. So with hikmah, she said, what she do, that she took the nice coats, nice hijabs, presentable and she used to sleep in the afternoon and when her husband came children are sleeping okay let's go out for the coffee let's go out for the dinner and husband was so happy after that you know she changed herself and then she changed her husband also now both are so happy and she's taking Islam side by side with hikmah and she's changing now so you see many times the hurdle is inside right we ourselves are weak We ourselves are weak. We can blame our circumstances, as we will see in the following surahs. We can blame our circumstances, but it's not our circumstances always that hinder us. We have the example of Asiya, the wife of Fir'aun. Did Fir'aun support her in her deen? No. He tortured her. Tortured her. He had appointed guards to ensure that she was suffering. Those guards would get tired and they would have to go take a break. But did she give up? No, she didn't. So the real hurdle is inside. Once you make up your mind that you want to do something, you are determined. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will create a way out for you. That's what I was thinking to mention, Asya alayhi salam. Yes, as Allah says in the Quran that, وَمَن يَتَّقِ اللَّهَ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ Makhraja. Whoever fears Allah, then Allah creates a way out for him. So, فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ مَسْتَطَعْتُمْ doesn't mean that you just start compromising. Because if you start compromising, then where are you going to stop? Where? You're going to lose yourself. There is a book by Seth Godin, What are you going to do when it's your turn? And it's always your turn. Long title, but it's an excellent book. And in that, he talks about compromise. That, you know, you want to do something, And the circumstances or the people that you're dealing with, they want you to compromise on certain things. They want you to let go of certain things. But he said, if you start compromising, then where are you going to start? And he gave his own example that he once prepared an omelet, right? And it was on a certain type of a skillet, a certain type of vegetables, a certain type of eggs, and that omelet turned out to be beautiful, right? And one of his friends who doesn't generally like omelet, they had it and they really enjoyed it. He said if the same omelet was going to be made in a restaurant, the reason why people don't like eating omelets at restaurants is because the skillet is not the same type. Why? Because it's difficult to wash that type of a skillet just for an omelet. Right? So you compromise on the on the tools that you're using. Right? Then the reason why omelets are not good is because they don't use the freshest of ingredients. Right? So compromise on the quality of the ingredients. 
You understand? And he said, once you start compromising on the tools and the ingredients, then what do you have at the end? An omelet that smells bad and you don't want to eat it. You understand what I'm talking about? Right? An egg that doesn't smell that good because you compromised. And when you start compromising one thing after the other, after the other, then you know what's going to happen? At the end, your product is not going to be what you wanted it to be. It's not of the same quality. It's not of the same standard. And you know whose fault it is? It's your own fault. Don't blame others. Because you gave them control. You let them dictate what you wanted to do. So don't blame them. فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ مَسْتَطَارْتُمْ does not mean start compromising. Pray here, don't pray there. Because people won't like it. Right? Don't wear hijab here, don't wear hijab there because people won't like it. Definitely there are certain situations where it becomes very tricky. So you do whatever is within your capacity with the intention to go further. This is why we make dua every night. رَبَّنَا وَلَا تُحَمِّلْنَا مَا لَا طَاقَةَ لَنَا بِهِ That, O oh, our Lord, do not burden us with that which we do not have the capacity to bear. Don't put us in a test that we cannot handle. So, فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ مَا اسْتَطَعْتُمْ وَاسْمَعُوا And listen. Listen to what? To that which you have been commanded to do. To that which you have been ordered to do. وَأَطِيعُوا And obey. Obey who? Allah and His Messenger. We just take the first part of the ayah. Allah says, فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ مَا اسْتَطَعْتُمْ Here it's very difficult for me. You know, I can't really help it. Everybody's drinking alcohol, so, you know, I have to. Everybody's shaking hands over here, so I have to as well. You understand what I mean? We start compromising on these little, little things. And then gradually, it's bigger things that we end up compromising on. The other day I was at this place and I saw a Muslim guy over there and uh, visibly Muslim and he was talking to a lady discussing something with her about a certain product and um, at the end she you know, took her hand out in order to give him a handshake and I don't know what he said but you know, he went like this and she was apologizing I just heard her saying sorry so basically he didn't shake her hand and I was like Wow. Wow. I was so amazed by that. Because here's a woman, attractive, right? Beautifully dressed. No doubt about that. Here's a man, alone. His dad's not watching him, right? I mean, his mother's not there, sister's not there, younger brother's not there. You know, nobody's, no friends are there by himself. I don't know what he said, but he said something. He saved himself. فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ مَا اسْتَطَعْتُمْ He saved himself. أَطِيعُوا Obey. You do the best that you can. And you know what? When you strive, then what happens? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also makes matters easy for you. وَأَطِيعُوا Obey. وَأَنْفِقُوا And spend. Meaning spend in the way of Allah. Why? Why spend? خَيْرًا لِأَنفُسِكُمْ Good for yourself. خَيْرًا can be understood as wealth because خَيْر is used for money in the Qur'an. So spend money for yourselves. What does it mean? Spend money in the way of Allah to benefit yourself, to help yourself. What what benefit does spending in the way of Allah bring to you? It brings forgiveness. Because we're human. We err, we make mistakes. We feel so much under pressure sometimes that we say things or we do things that are inappropriate and later on we regret. Right? That in that moment, somebody took their hand out, we also just shook their hand. We're like, oh my God, what am I doing? You understand? Somebody is being too frank and we also become very frank. And we're like, oh my God, what am I doing? What did I just do? We forgot. So, Anfiqu, spend in order to earn Allah's forgiveness. Wash away those sins by spending in the way of Allah. وَمَن يُوقَ شُحَّ نَفْسِهِ And whoever is saved from the shuh of his soul, the stinginess of his soul, فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ Then it is those who will be successful. 
This is the real problem. Shuh. It's our own selves. What is shuh? Greed and stinginess of extreme level. Greed and stinginess. So it's our greed for the world. It's our selfishness that holds us back. So whoever is saved from it, then such people are successful. In تُقْرِضُ اللَّهَ If you lend Allah قَرْضًا حَسَنًا A good loan, a beautiful loan, meaning if you spend in the way of Allah, يُضَاعِفْهُ لَكُمْ Allah will multiply that for you. He will give you reward many times. وَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ And He will forgive you. وَاللَّهُ شَكُورٌ حَلِيمٌ And Allah is most appreciative and forbearing. عَالِمُ الْغَيْبِ shahada, Knower of the unseen and the witnessed. He knows everything. You see, عَالِمُ الْغَيْبِ What does it mean? When we are in the ghayb from the people, meaning when they can't see us, when the mom's not there, when the dad's not there, when the wife is not there, when the husband's not there, when the Qur'an teacher's not there, when the friend from Qur'an school is not there. You understand my point? غيب. Nobody's there. But who's watching? Allah's watching. shahada. And also when everybody is watching, Allah still knows. Al-Azizul Hakim, The exalted in might. The one who has full power over us. Al-Hakim, The most wise. He put you in that test. Knowing that you could pass it. لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها. So why did you think of yourself as so weak? Why did you allow yourself to fail? سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته